The never say die angels giving their fans a thrill down the stretch. Nan delivers and it's belted left field in the gap. It's in there for a double. Here comes Biggins. Here comes Anderson. The Angels take the lead, six to five. A lot of that World Series was, is kind of a blur. Be, you know, I don't remember a lot of specifics. But that at bat, you must. That at bat, I remember. Um, Do you just replay that in your head all the time? <laughs> no, no? I don't think about oh, it. Oh, man. I don't think about it. It was 22 years ago. The time has finally come. It is the first two episodes release of the Setup Man podcast. For those of you who don't know, my name is Kyle Stanley. I am the host of the Setup Man podcast. And you get to know a lot about my story and why I started this podcast by watching our introduction video or listening to our introduction podcast right here on whatever platform you're listening to or watching. And, and I'm just excited. I know a lot of you are like, okay, just get to it. Troy Gloss, I've been excited to hear from him. First of all, I want to give you a couple different things that are going on. This is actually one of two podcasts that we release at the same time because I want to give you an opportunity to hear from two people and kind of binge as we start here. The other one is Matt Strom. He's a left-handed pitcher for the Philadelphia Phillies. He is a great interview and he's a big card collector like I used to be. And so we get to uh, talk a little bit about that. Now, if you aren't already, remember to subscribe and leave a review, whether you're on YouTube or the podcast. If you're on the podcast right now, leave a review, give us five stars. That really, really helps us, especially as we get started here to grow and to help people know more about the Setup Man podcast. If you're on YouTube, liking, subscribing, and commenting on the video is huge for engagement as well. And again, that just helps with the algorithm for more people to know what we're doing and all this great content that we're about to start doing. Also, if you aren't following us on social media, we've got Twitter, at Setup Man Pod, and Instagram, at Setup Man Pod. And what I want to tell you too is if you haven't already subscribed to our list on setupman.net, you're going to want to do that. Here's why. I'm going to be doing a lot of giveaways, especially in the beginning here, for those that are subscribed to my list. And the only way that you're going to know if I'm doing a giveaway is if you're actually subscribed to that list and that's when you're going to get those emails, okay? So just go to setupman.net and whether it is swag, whether it is going to be from some of our upcoming sponsors, which by the way, we've got some really cool ones coming up, or uh, I'm also going to be trying to get some memorabilia from these people that I'm interviewing, maybe a signed baseball, maybe a signed shirt. Make sure you're subscribed to our list so you can be a part of those giveaways. Now, the whole reason you're here, Troy Gloss. I'm excited to show this interview with him. Honestly, this was like my favorite interview that we've done so far. I've done about nine or 10. And Troy was a character. The guy was a lot of fun to talk to. He had a lot of really cool stories to share. Um, you're going to notice we actually do a puzzle while we're doing this. Why are we doing a puzzle? Well, Troy is going to talk a little bit as we start the podcast about this brain study that he did. And I kind of did some research and I kind of asked Google, what are some cool things that you can do to help with improving your brain health and doing a puzzle is one of them. And I asked Troy and he's like, I love puzzles. And so I said, yeah, let's do a puzzle while we do this. Uh, how far we get in that puzzle? Well, you'll see. Uh, we also talk about the 2002 World Series, his time in the Olympics, and also some cool things like the contact issues that he had, the eyesight issues that he had while he was uh, playing for a number of different teams. And so what I also want to tell you is that we had an exclusive story that he shared that's not going to be in this interview. It's on Instagram only. So make sure to go to our Instagram page at SetupManPod and check out that interview, that story, I should say, about Cal Ripken Jr. He has a really, really cool story that I think you guys are going to love. So make sure to check it out on our Instagram page. All right, I'm going to stop blabbering. Let's get to it right now with Troy Gloss here on the Setup Man Podcast. All right, Troy, so we're here. Uh, you... And I talked a little bit about this before, so anyone who's watching this on YouTube right now is like, why are you guys in front of a puzzle? <laughs> well, uh, we share a, a common uh, passion, I guess. I love doing puzzles. But you, especially um, because of this brain study that you did recently that's really made a big difference on your life, yes. I decided, hey, let's let's have some fun with it. Let's do a puzzle while we're doing <laughs> this. I don't know about you. I like to start with borders. Of and course. Since this is going to be probably about an hour, I don't think we're going to put together a no. 500 page <laughs> puzzle. So let's see if we can at least get the right. borders going. Wonderful. And uh, in the meantime, tell me about what this brain study was and why you decided to do it. Yeah, so, you know, about two years ago, I was really, really struggling just okay. with life in general, some relationships and things like that. So, I was, you know, I was, I was drinking too much. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, just not being very present around uh, 
with my son and mm. my wife at that point. Okay. Um, and I got in contact with a doctor named Dr. Amon, who, you know, one of the few, he was a, you know, psychologist by trade. Okay. Or a psychiatrist um, by trade. Um, but he kind of looked at it from a different, uh, different view, right? He looked at it, says, with the, with the kind of the thought of nobody ever looks at someone's brain. Right, you're trying to you're trying to resolve an issue. They're looking at without it. taking an actual picture of it, right? Diagnosing if you break your, the right, if you break your arm, yeah, you get an X-ray, yeah, right. You hurt your shoulder pitching, you get an MRI, right. You go in there with with uh, some mental issues or or just whatever the issues might be. Get a psychiatrist. You get a psychiatrist, yeah. and they just throw stuff at you, medications at you, and hope it sticks. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd gone through that a little bit, and it. Obviously, was not working. Yeah. So went in there, had a brain scan. Um, obviously, it showed that we were not functioning at peak capacity. What did that look like? What when you say you looked at the brain so scan? So it, it takes a um, takes a scan of it. Okay. Um, and it gives you a three D well on a computer, right? It kind of gives you a three D model of what it looked like. Okay. Um, it's kind of supposed to be pretty smooth and pretty equal, and mine was very much rigid or ridged. Um, I could track just about every major concussion I had ever had. Wow. Um, by spots on it. Um, so it just wasn't functioning well, and I had to get it back healthy, right? Drinking probably had definitely had a lot to do with it, but yeah. also head trauma as a kid, um, you know, as young kids do, right? You crash yeah. a motorcycle, you crash your bike, you do this, you do that. I got hit in the head when I was in college, right? And it knocked me out, so there was a spot there. Wow. Um, so there was just, there was damage. Right, it was like anything. It was like anything you damaged, right? Yeah. And, and it was a built. And, and his program, along with obviously talking to him, uh, really kind of it helps heal those spots, right? The the issues, right? And yeah. You know, I was functioning the parts of my brain that were really really hot, meaning like they were really firing a lot. Was you know, emotions and reactions and things like that, where the rest of it kind of common. You know, uh, how would I put it? Uh, kind of like regular day stuff, right? It was just kind of quiet. Okay. Right. So the point is getting it all functioning. Excuse me. At its peak capacity. So I've been doing them for about two years. Um, each scan is a little bit better. Um, part of that's diet. Uh, obviously, stopping drinking, which has been yeah. been good. Um, you know, but it just it, it's just an overall health okay way of going about things. Um, and it's really helped really. I mean, it really, really, it it was, you know, it was a dark time and a dark place for me. Um, but it's, you know, obviously it's, it's, you know, there, there's, everybody has their struggles every day. Yeah. Um, it didn't go away, but it feels better. So when you say, you know, dark times, how, how did all this pop up in your life? You're talking about, you know, some of it on an emotional side, some of it on a, day-to-day side, what did it look like maybe even through the lens of the people closest to you? Well, yeah, it, it was just, I was just not there, even though I was physically there, just emotionally and mentally, I wasn't there. Huh. Um, I was not re- present? Yeah, I was yeah. reacting to things, you know, not an appropriate reaction, I say not appropriate in the sense that I would overreact okay. to certain things, underreact to others, Okay. you know, and it just, you know, my wife, you know, basically just said, hey, listen, we got we to gotta get this figured out, right? There's something going on mm. here. Um, well, how great that she was wanting to work with yeah, you on that. Which yeah, which is great, right? Yeah. And, you know, I, I didn't want to really kind of, I didn't want to have my son go through that. I wanted to be here mm-hmm. all the time for him. Um, I wanted to be part of his life, present with his life, and, and, and a part of it. So, you know, it was time for me to get straight, get right. Yeah. So what did that process look like to getting right? You see that the brain is not functioning what right did, what did he have you do so there's some supplements we took it was all natural right okay. supplement stuff but uh diet certainly i mean the key is obviously i stopped drinking which really helps yeah you know um <clears throat> so that's been a couple years now um but it's just uh you know it was it was just an overall health and well-being kind of thing mm-hmm. um you know you can't necessarily just throw something at it and, and it sticks yeah right it takes time and it's a process Right. Yeah. And, uh, it's been really good, right. It's been really good that I, I, you know, I've been able to 
you know, for the better part of a couple of years now, work at it and get better and yeah. be more around and be more present. And it's been good. Is that the biggest change is feeling like you're more present? Give me like an example. For sure. Like, I, or I'm just reacting to situations in an appropriate fashion, okay. right? In, in, in terms of, of overreacting and underreacting, right? Yeah. I mean, it could be a simple thing with my son, right? And on the field, you know, he gets upset, he rolled over or whatever, and then I, I would lose it. Yeah. Right. And not because I wanted to lose it, but I didn't really have the tools or the ability to not lose it. Okay. Right. And now it's, I'm just overall calmer. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'll still, I'll still lose it. Yeah. On you're occasion, a competitor. <laughs> on occasion. But it just, it more, it was just, uh, I guess it was more just having kind of an appropriate response. Yeah. To, to, to a situation instead of just being either here and then flying off the handle and then trying to come back. Right. right? And then flying off again. It's, there's even times where I shocked myself and I was like, something will happen and I'll, I'll react to it calmly or whatever. And I was like, well, that's, there's growth. That's yeah. new. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> right? That's new. That's awesome. <laughs> Do you feel like you were seeing signs of this while you were playing or did it really pop up after? Uh, that, I'm sure it all, I mean, it all started then. Okay. I'm sure. Um, but you're, you know, we're, we're in the grind, right? We're just putting our head down and playing and getting to the next day and getting to the next day and getting yeah. to the next day. Um, where when you're retired, you don't have a whole hell of a lot going on. Yeah. Right. So it was just, you know, it was it was more just kind of getting, getting comfortable with with the new what what the new reality is. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, this this next this step coming up here to Clovis and and coaching that never would have happened if this was two years ago. Never. Wow. I just was I wasn't emotionally or mentally ready to do that. So. When, when you talk about, you know, especially the, the transition from going from playing to yeah. being at home and not having a lot to do, what was that like just from a, a transitional lifestyle? It was nice for a while. Yeah. Um, you know, I picked up golf, played, started playing some competitive golf, and that, that took that cool. urge away. You any good? For a while. I got pretty good. good. And then at the same time, I was, you know, I was traveling around the country. We were playing in some uh, national four balls and things like that with a friend of mine. Um, but then it just kind of became a job again. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was I, I was put I was out there practicing all the time. I was you know playing four or five days a week, mm -hmm. and I was still finishing tenth. Because you know I'm not a golfer. I'm a yeah. baseball player who's playing golf. Yeah, yeah. Right. All my the, my friends who were in, when I was living in Florida at the time. You know, a couple of them had mini toured. They played in college. Okay. Like, like you're just going to be better than me no matter what. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> it's like, and I was like, I don't I don't really enjoy finishing tenth. Um, especially when I do, you do when I'm doing something that I thought at a level that was really good. Yeah. Um, well, as a competitor, I, I find that a lot of us, if we're not going to be the best at it, we kind of just like, well, screw this. I don't want to go any further. Right. It's like I got I got kind of as good as I was going to get. Yeah. I thought. Yeah. Um, and that was that was good enough for me. Okay. So I just kind of stopped playing. Um, part of it was you know then it started becoming a social event more than an actual. Uh, yeah. Athletic event, mm -hmm. um, which was obviously detrimental. <laughs> you yeah. know, you go out there, have a couple of beers, this, that, and the other, and all For of sure. a sudden you're, you know, by the time you go home, you're six or seven in, and you're like, you know, it just it was a, it was a, a spiral. Yeah. Right. So I just took that out and I stopped playing. Right. So that gave me one last opportunity to get to that spot. That's cool. So I feel like a lot of people though don't really talk about the transition of going from playing to just being at home. Right. Do you? Feel like that was something that you were prepared for, or was did it just hit you like a ton of bricks? Um, I knew, I knew I was done playing. Okay. Um, so so that was, you know, I fortunately got to go out as, as the old saying on my own terms. Okay. Right. Like I didn't get released and that kind of stuff to where now all of a sudden people aren't calling you and you want a job but you're not getting one. Um, so I, that was that was made the transition easier. Um, just because I physically couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. Right. Baseball's a young man's game. Everybody's throwing a hundred and I'm getting older. That's a bad combination. <laughs> right. Like, like my bat speed's slowing down and everybody else is throwing harder. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> that's tough to keep up. With. Yeah. It's tough to yeah. keep up. Right. And that was fine. And I couldn't run anymore and it was just, it was bad. Okay. So, you know, it, it so in terms of that, I, I went home feeling good about it. Okay. That's um, good. I didn't feel like I got cheated, which was good. Um, but, all of a sudden, for 30 years, 35 years of my life, really, I'd always had somewhere to go. I'd always had a reason yeah. to go. I'd had people telling me, you need to be here then, and, you know, here, yeah. there, buses at four, you know, be there, you know, BP's here, 
games at one, games at seven, games. The whole you know. day was so it was playing out. So I never yeah. had to have a thought about it, mm -hmm. right? And then all of a sudden, the highlight of my day is waking up. Yeah, that's. And then the only thing I got, the only thing I have to do that day is go to bed, right? <laughs> at some point. So it became it was difficult, right? And it was it was hard to kind of wrap my head around. So and, the, and the golf took care of that for a while. Okay. But then, like I said, it just became. It was more of a job at that point. The right? golf was? The, yeah, because yeah. it's just, I wasn't getting, you know, I got to a point where I was good enough to be, I was good enough to be good, but I wasn't good enough to win. Yeah. yeah. Right? And I don't like not winning. <laughs> you know, I, same. You know, I, <laughs> I, I, I really kind of hate losing even more than I like winning. Um, you know, so it was, uh, it, it just became not fun anymore, right? It became more of a job. I'd come home mad because, oh my God, it, you know, my wife would be like, well, what'd you shoot today? I was like, oh, you know, I shot 68. It should have been a 66 because I missed two putts and this and that and the other. And it was just, she's like, what are you doing? This is a hobby, right? Like, uh -huh. that's, I'm not wired to just have hobbies, right? Like, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to be good at it. Or I'm not going to do it, right? <laughs> like, yeah. Or I'll just not do it. Yeah. So it was, uh, and, and when that kind of started happening, and then it said, like I said, it just kind of fell into more of a social event. And then that was just unhealthy, right? So I... Just stop playing, and I have I play a couple times a year now, and I have fun doing it. And That's good. if I hit a ball out of bounds, I just throw another one down, and you know, like it's yeah. a big deal, right? Like I can, I can still hit good shots, but my misses are worse <laughs> because I'm not swinging a golf club every day. Um, but it, so I have fun now, right? And I can I can do that where before I wasn't unless I was playing really hard or really well, I wasn't having fun doing it. Well, I'll tell you what. I am the king of being the best bad golfer out there. So uh, if you're if you're breaking seventy though, I mean that's impressive. I'm I've broken ninety once in my life, and I was stoked about that. So uh, you're gonna find some good golf courses out here yeah. in Fresno. So I'm excited for you. Uh, but you also mentioned that you're gonna be coaching, and uh, I want to just know really quickly, you know, what was the and by the way, I gotta. I'm. I'm not gonna call you out, but I'm gonna call you out. I've, I've got a few more pieces that I've put together here. Well, no, huh? <laughs> you're talking. Multitasking too. Yeah, is yeah, not my yeah. jam. <laughs> okay, okay. Like uh, when I lock in, I lock in, and I'll get it done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing two things at once is not my best move. Okay. okay. Well, then after we stop recording, <laughs> you're just gonna go at this puzzle then. <laughs> uh, so you're coming back. Well, you actually you're coming to Fresno, coming to Clovis, and yes. coaching at Buchanan. Uh, tell me what led to that decision, and did you have any ties? It was kind of you know for yeah. a lot of us locals, we were like, "What, Troy Cross? Right. That's awesome." So you know, I have family friends, close okay. family friends that live in town. Um, got a college roommate that I played with at UCLA. He lives in town. Um, so Clovis wasn't and Fresno wasn't a, an unknown. Okay, um, probably wasn't on your radar though. No, it was yeah. not. To be honest, but it was, uh, you know, it, it was something, my son's now old enough where I didn't have to feel like I had to be on top of everything all the time, mm -hmm. right? It's time for him to spread his wings, you know, in terms of his baseball career and also his school, right? So um, I was kind of thinking about what I was going to do, and I didn't even know what that was going to be. Um, and then this kind of fell in my lap, and it really kind of started making me think, you know, after I went to spring training this year with the Angels for five days, and that really, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Right. I really had fun doing it. Um, and I didn't know if I was going to, but I did it as a favor. You know, Phil Nevin, the manager, is one of my best friends. And oh, cool. So, you know, I did it as, as a favor to him because he asked me to, but then I really enjoyed it. So that kind of started piquing my interest as, as to coaching. Um, I, I had coached at a high school in Florida when I was there, just help, helping a friend out um, and enjoyed it. Right. But, in, but, I, but because I was the assistant, I couldn't necessarily put everything in and do everything that I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, so then that kind of, so the conversation kind of started, right? And then okay. I started thinking about it and it started fit, you know, ticking more and more boxes. Yeah. Um, and then ultimately I just decided that this was going to be a great move for myself individually, but also a great move for my son to getting back. He'd been homeschooled in San Diego, getting back into school, cool. you know, getting into, uh, you know, school sports and yeah. baseball, you know, he's kind of perfect timing too. Right. It's not like he's leaving a different school. He's starting. Right. And new. it's kind of one of those things where he's, he's, he's an incoming seventh grader. So like, if you wait, you know, if it's kind of not done by the time you get to high school, you're probably going to stay where you're at. Yeah. You know? Um, so it was, it kind of, it was kind of a good timing for everything. Um, and it, and it really kind of ticked a lot of boxes, right? It was, it was good for him. And ultimately if it wasn't good for him, then I wouldn't have done it. But yeah, okay. But it was uh, good for me, good for him, 
Um, and I think he'll, th- I, I know he'll thrive here, right? It's, it's a great community and it's, it's an opportunity, um, you know, for him to kind of spread his wings and, yeah. ma- and make his own name. It's interesting too, because you said that you were, you know, assistant coach over in Florida. Yeah. You come and you're, you're the head coach at one. I know that you're brand new to the Fresno and Clovis area, but Buchanan has a long track record yes, of winning. Does. So is there some pressure that comes in with that? Um, yeah, for sure. But, yeah. but I'm good with that. Like pressure to me is you only, you're, there's only pressure if there's expectations Yeah. and expectations are great. Absolutely. Right. Like I, I it, it pressure's never been one thing that been something that's really ever bothered me. Because I want people to expect me to do well. Okay. Right? That, that, that's a good thing. Absolutely. Um, and I've, I've been fortunate to be, or, you know, fortunate or not, but to have success in, in pressure situations, um, certainly in my playing days. And it was, you know, so I, I look forward to it. Okay. Maybe, maybe some people don't, but I do. Like, I'm, I'm totally cool with having expectations and pressure because that's, I put that same pressure on myself. Because I expect to be good at this. Yeah. I expect the team to be good. Maybe great. We'll see. Right? That that's gonna see that's gonna fall under, you know, how how many of these kids, you know, how do they are they work hard, right? And 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 some of just a talent thing, right? I I know we're all we got good players. And, you know, if we're if they're re- willing to dedicate it and, and dedicate to the, the to the team and to the sport, they'll be they'll be better than they probably even know they could be. Um, and we're going to play a fun style of baseball, so they'll, they'll enjoy it. Okay, cool. Well, you talk about pressure. I mean, it's obvious that you performed at top pressure moments. You know, you were a great ball player, but especially when the postseason started, mm-hmm. man, you turned it on to another level. 2002 World Series MVP. Do you think that that desire to enjoy pressure uh, was something that you were born with, or was it something that was developed over time? Talk about that. I think, you know, I think you can become, you know, I... I I would say a little bit of both, right? Okay. Um, the more pressure situations you were in, the, well, I take this back. You become a little bit more desensitized to the, to the situations. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, if, if you're not having success in those situations, they obviously can bury you as well. Yeah. Right? So um, I've always put pressure on myself to be the best player I could be. And that, and that's been good enough. Right, that's been good for me over my career. Um, but that being said, it, it's you know it, it's never. I want to put this the right way. It's it, it it's not really making the situation bigger than it is. Yeah. Right. It's understanding how to rationalize where we are. Mm-hmm. Um, I've said this a lot about playing in the World Series when people ask me about postseasons and things like that. Everything else is different before the game, after the game. Um, the name, the title of the game. Yeah. Right. But once the first pitch is made, it's the same, it's game. The same game. We're yeah. playing. A, we're playing a team we played in June. Like I, game one, they they started Jason Schmidt. Well, we played him in interleague play. Yeah. So it wasn't like this was a team we didn't we knew nothing about. The only thing that really was different was that somebody upstairs named the game different. Right. That's so good perspective. You know. So once it actually started, it wasn't any different. Right? I'm still facing a guy who's throwing 97 with a good slider, yeah. just like I did in June. Right? <laughs> Even though, I mean, you know, I, I, I agree with that, but also, you know, it's those games, those playoff games that the fans remember the most and talk about for years and years. For you sure. never, never added any pressure on top of that, just knowing that it meant so much more to the fans? Uh, there's nothing they could have done to have to put more pressure or expectations on myself that I didn't already, already put on myself. Yeah. Right? Um, it was, it, it's... I wanted to win. Mm-hmm. I didn't care who was the who who had the best. I, I didn't care who had the, who had the best series, who had the okay. best game. Who, I didn't care. I just wanted to win games. Right at that point, we played two hundred games that year. Yeah, at some we, we <laughs> spring training in the season, and then into that we all you know we were all on you know I don't know one hundred ninety five two hundred games. Like yeah. we've played this long, we might as well win, right? <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Um, so it's you know it. it it, it just really was not, there was nothing that anybody on the outside was going to do to make me feel different about what was going on right there during mm-hmm. that and while it was going on. That's good. Right? Because I was putting as much pressure on myself as anybody could to be successful so our team could win. Yeah. Right? And, and there, like I said, there was nothing anybody else on the outside could have done to change that. Hmm. 
That's good. I think it's a good time to start talking about the 2002 World Series. Mm -hmm. You got rally monkeys all over the place. You got yeah. sticks that are making crazy noise that oh. we've never seen in the stadiums. You got Bonds trying to one you know, all on his own take care of you guys. I mean, there's so many things that I remember about that World Series even more so than even the year before with 2001, an amazing World Series mm -hmm. between the Yankees and the Diamondbacks. But this one was just like, man, what sticks out to you when you think back to that entire seven game series? You know, it was that team that the, the Angels team that year was, it was unlike any other team I'd ever played on. Yeah. Um, you know, we started the season terribly. I think we were six and 14 or something to start, oh, wow. to start the season. Um, and really we kind of sat down and had a little come to Jesus moment for all of us. Okay. Right. You know, the old team meeting. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Those actually work, huh? <laughs> well, Sometimes, sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, right? And you know, we we had we had a couple of suspensions coming out of spring training for a fight that we had in spring training. Oh wow! Myself and Spezio were involved in, um, and and one of our pitchers. We had guys that were a little bit banged up, so we weren't at top. We we weren't running all cylinders yeah. to start the game, but start Sounds the season. Like but that's not an excuse, right? We we just played like crap. Okay. Um. And it really kind of we we kind of looked at each other in the mirror, right? It looked at all of us. Right in the in our faces and and just decided that, that this team is too good to be this bad. Mm. And what were we going to do to change? Right. And and what what did you guys? It was come it to was do? more it was more just a change of attitude. Right. Like okay. we, we we were went a hundred percent all in. Right. Like you, nobody cares who's driving the runs in. Nobody cares who's scoring the runs. Nobody cares who's getting the win. Who's getting the pitcher's perspective? Who's getting mm -hmm. credit for the win? You know, we were going to move runners. We were going to. Get the guy in from third. Do the little things that it took to win win baseball games. Okay, and we just took off from there. Um, you know, I think we ended up winning ninety nine games that year. So that whatever that was ninety three and something for the next one hundred and forty two games. Pretty damn good. So that was really good. Yeah. Um, you know, but it was it was it, there was a cohesiveness amongst us. A lot of us were homegrown. Okay. Um, so there was kind of a bond there. Um, the Angels did a really good job there in the early. 90s, uh, or, well, actually, all the way through the 90s, like every year, it was kind of one guy came up, one guy came up, one rookie came up. You know, it started with Just Tim. Pieces. Started with Tim Salmon, yeah. uh, ended with John Lackey, and uh, and Francisco Rodriguez. Stunned. Right. So, yeah. you know, they were, and then you know, I was in that. Washburn was in that. Molina was in that. Um, you know, Adam Kennedy, although he came from the Cardinals, you know, was start started. He was not in the minor leagues with us, but he this was where he got his start. Mm -hmm. Um, you had Garrett Anderson, David, uh, uh, Darren Erstad, Tim Salmon, you know, all the, I mean, we, Scott Schoenweiss in the bullpen, Troy Percival, we were all homegrown. Yeah. We were all angel draft, draft picks minus AK, right? We were all angel draft picks. So we had, we had a bond there yeah. that was different than any other team I'd really been, er, that I played on. But it really was, it was, you know, we had each other's backs, mm. you know, we had, you know, it was, it, if, if someone was scuffling, we picked them up. Right, nobody's good all the time, mm -hmm. right? If someone's having a tough go of it on the mound, we pick him up, we call time, we talk to him, you know, try to try to nurse him through that game, help him through that game. But again, like the egos, the egos were out the door, you know. You, you hear that a lot, right? Like, oh, we checked our egos at the door, right? And yeah, that term was brought up, <laughs> but really, that that team did that. Like, we did not care. Mm. We didn't care what anybody said about us. We didn't care what anybody. Again, what anybody on the outside could not break yeah. us, right? It was it was our twenty five going forward throughout that year, and let's see how good we can be. And it turned out to be obviously really good. Um, but what it was, it, it was just a, it was like a brotherhood, right? Yeah. Like it was really, you know, I'm still close to a lot of those guys, cool. right? And and it's, you know, we've been through, been you know, been in the trenches with each other, right? Yeah. And and you know, and and. Um, you know, I would never be, I would never compare, obviously, a baseball game to war. That's a whole different thing. But, but sure. you know, the, the I'm, brotherhood I'm struggling is still to come there. up with a different term. Yeah, but, but the brotherhood is on right. either side. Yeah, and you, you got know, each other's backs. And yeah. it's just, and, you know, there were guys, and the guys who were from outside had to come in, they bought in too. Oh, that's right. Great. And it you was, right, of course. And really, from an offensive perspective, we played super aggressive on the bases. We were, dove, you know, we were diving for balls. We were, you know, we were just doing everything to, to help win that game that day. Mm -hmm. And then tomorrow, let's do it all over again. It was it was just it was as much fun as I've ever had playing uh, that year. Just because, and not because we were winning, yeah. But just because 
like you knew the, the guy next to you had your back. Yeah. Right? And that's, that's super important. When you talk about this brotherhood, you, typically there's one or two guys that are leading it. Uh, how much was Sosha getting in, and, and who were those one or two guys that really were like, hey, we've, we want to make this statement for everyone? Yeah, you know what? Percy was the biggest, you know, he was the biggest one, uh, Troy Percival. Nice. Um, you know, but it was like that we didn't really have that one stand up. I mean, Percy was a pitcher, right? But right. from the offensive perspective, we didn't have really that one guy who stood up and said, okay, this is my, this is my group. Sure. We just did it all together. Right, That's like cool. we 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 were accountable to each other. Anybody could could uh, anybody was was able to could uh, jump someone's sh- little bit. Yeah, um, and that happened. Um, cool. But also, it, we all knew that it came with love, hmm. right? It came with respect. Yeah, um, and really, nobody much got out of got out of line. <laughs> it just because everybody just kind of fell in place, and and this and we were going. How cool! Um, you know, over the course of. Six months with twenty five type A personalities in one room. Yeah, there were there were arguments. <laughs> of course, right? it's gonna be. There were discussions. Yeah, yeah, you know, heated discussions. But you know, I think we all knew, like, it, it, no matter what anybody was saying to any any other individual, it all came, it all came with love, and it came with That's good. respect. That's good. Cool. So it was fantastic. Okay. Before I ask my next question, I am eyeing two pieces over there. Yeah, what do you got? That I know are going to work. Oh, there we, we got go. those letterings right there yeah, yeah. and then maybe something right there All right, too. sounds good. Let's see. Let's try that out. I think that one that looks one like go. a winner. There we go. Oop. Is it? Yep. Yeah. Made. Nice. There and we go. I got it. That, see, oh, you're much yeah. better at multitasking there than I am. There we go. There we go. By the way, apologies for this being a Cubs uh, ah, puzzle. Well. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. <laughs> Uh, I can say the same to you, brother. <laughs> uh, well, when the Giants fans come to me and they're like, oh, you know, God, we still remember 2 you, you, you screwed us. I'm like, listen. Listen. I would have screwed anyone. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Don't take it personal. Yeah. But you won three cents. You're going yeah, o- okay. to you're gonna have to get over this. You're okay. Right? Like, you're going to have to get over it. I got over Steve Bartman. They <laughs> yeah. can get over you. Ooh, wait. <laughs> we yeah. won't go into that. No, his name, uh, his name. I was watching the game the other night, and somebody reached over and caught a fly ball, and his name popped up course. again. Of uh, course. Poor guy. Yeah. Poor guy. Poor guy. Uh, we it's don't need It's something that everybody else would have done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we don't buried. need to get into it now. There's but now there's those fences, so he couldn't do it now. You but know, I think yeah. this guy was far enough down the line. You think so? I think he was okay. All right. But still, like yeah. again, you've won one. Yeah. Since we have, we have uh, probably nobody happier than Steve Bartman himself. Oh my God! Yeah. <laughs> no, going back to the 2002 World Series, mm-hmm. the two things that stand out as a fan: the Rally Monkey and those sticks. The Man, thunder sticks. First of all, let's talk about the Rally Monkey. Was yeah. It, was it real? Yeah. Like, did, did that actually pump you guys up? Oh, you know, like, <laughs> what did was really the crowd noise and, and the course. things that, that came with it. You know, the monkey itself, no. But <laughs> but it is a real monkey. We, he, you they brought him out sometimes. You touched it, saw it? I didn't touch it. Okay. No, no, no. No, but it was, I think it was, it, and don't, like, don't quote me on this, but I think it might have actually been, remember the, the Marcel, the monkey? No, from, from Friends? I think it might have been the same guy. Is that a... Theory, or do you actually perfect? Totally theory. Okay, <laughs> I have no, I have no scientific proof of that being okay. true at all. But they look the same. They That's look all the I got. Same. That's all I got. They do look the right? same. And how many little monkeys wearing diapers can there be running around, the, <laughs> running around the world? Like I don't know. Well, especially in Hollywood, right? Right. Like, like yeah. I don't know. Like you know, I don't know how many, well, whatever kind of monkeys those are are trained to, yeah, yeah. to like hang out. Like yeah. I don't know. There can't be many. <laughs> but anyway, they look the same. Oh, uh, but yeah, and and the, the thundersticks, man, those things were loud, dude. I, those, they didn't show up until uh, until the playoffs, obviously. Yeah. But you know, it was that year we actually played uh, in the ALCS. We played mm-hmm. the Twins, and it was still in the old Metrodome. Oh man! And all that noise just gets traps in there. That was the loudest I'd ever heard. Oh yeah, in, inside. Um, you know, there was it's a football stadium, right? So there was I don't know sixty some thousand people roof everybody's waving white flags you can't see anything the roof's white the people are white you know the 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 the, the, the towels are white you know all the people are swinging white towels you couldn't see a damn thing yeah and but just the level of noise that was in there was unbelievable like i couldn't i couldn't talk to my shortstop at all like i could scream at the top of my lungs and he couldn't hear me yeah um but the loudest but angel stadium with those thunder sticks by far and away not even close the loudest outside 
game I ever played. I felt like that started a trend because then you started seeing at all these other venues, the Thunder Sticks. Yeah, and right? it's a repeat. Yeah. Everybody seems like it's a good, then they think, oh, that's a great idea. We'll do that too. You yeah. know, like it's a, you know, they, they imitate. Were you surprised at how into those sticks the fans got? I remember you know, seeing them and just being like, that's stupid. But then oh, when no, you no. saw everyone going at it. You know, it, it just became, you know, it, it, it allowed them to just make noise without just yeah. screaming for three hours. Yeah. Um, but it was, like I said, it was, they, 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 those fans had been so close on a, on a couple of occasions um, to even getting to the World Series mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, c certainly the ones that had been around 30 or 40 years. As fans, you know, they were, they really, really, they were into it and they wanted it. Um, you know, we saw halfway through the year, we started selling games out. And, That's cool. You know, it was fantastic. And that trend lasted for probably a few years, I would think. Um, you know, it just, the, the level of noise that they were able to maintain. Because yeah. you can only scream for so long, right? <laughs> you can't scream for three straight hours. But you can bang these things for three straight hours. Absolutely. And so the level of noise that the fans were able to maintain throughout the course of the games were was unbelievable. Yeah. So the Giants blow you guys out to take a three to two lead, right? I don't know the order, but yeah. Yeah, I, I believe that was game five. <laughs> I know and, we came back. We came back three to two. I do know that. I, yeah. don't, know, I don't know in order which order any of those games happened, but I, I, if memory serves correctly, I think it was game five. It was like sixteen to four or something. Yeah. Like so that. I, the, the three games in St. Louis or in San Francisco, yeah. I don't remember the order. Right. You but know, back, but I, I do know we won one and lost two. Back in Angel <laughs> Stadium, though, you guys are down five nothing in the seventh yes. inning, and I mean. I just remember like, okay, this, this game's over. And you start in the bottom of the seventh, this little mini rally. Yep. Spezio hits the three run bomb. Mm -hmm. Talk about the, what was going on in that dugout at five, nothing. And then what was going on at five to three. So a couple things. Yeah. One is, you know, after the game, you know, obviously they talked about Dusty Baker handing the ball to Russ Ortiz. And sure. we didn't see any of that. I didn't know about that till after the game. Okay. So when, you know, the reporters and the things were trying to get us, oh, did that, that, that fire you up? And did you? I was like, we never even saw it. Yeah. But that's neither here nor there. This is just another example of that team being very special. We truly believed that we were going to win every game we played. Wow. Like, we were shocked when we lost. And it... And it and you lose. Baseball, you, you lose games. Nobody wins them all, mm -hmm. right? Nobody goes 162-0, and 0, right? But we were truly surprised when, you lost. when we lost games. Yeah. And, you know, because we'd done so much winning throughout the year after our 20-game start. Of course. You know, no one in our dugout, no one in our clubhouse, no one in the bullpen, no one on our coaching staff ever thought that we were ever going to lose that game. Mm. It never even crossed our minds. Even while you're down 5 nothing. Never even crossed wow. our minds. I never had a thought that we weren't going to win that game wow. or thought about losing that game, mm -hmm. right? It, it, we knew we could put runs up. We knew our bullpen could keep them from scoring, mm. right? So then it was our job to catch up, and then it'll be the bullpen's job to hold it, which they ultimately did. But, mm -hmm. you know, we knew we could, we could explode at any moment to get runs, um, and, and then and then you did and then we did yeah right? and it was just so that inning started I mean I don't remember what I don't remember what I did to start the inning but I know I was on second base when Spees hit the three run homer uh, next inning Ersty goes deep uh, off Laurel um, they brought in Nin who I'd faced a couple times but you know he's no fun yeah he's a great guy <laughs> I've, I've hung out with him since we played golf but you know he probably has a different way of looking at that at bat but it was uh, like I. I you know, I faced him as a Marlin a couple years before, and I was like, okay, this guy's good. But I do remember having a conscious thought, like, okay, if we can get this game tied, now we can kind of start over, mm. right, and, and reload. And I like, and, and I think our bullpen's going to beat their bullpen, especially since they'd already gotten to their closer, right? And <clears throat> Nana threw me a first pitch cutter down the way, and I looked terrible. And I knew it was coming just because that's what he throws, right? And I would... I just got too excited. Yeah. Right. I wanted to hurry. I wanted to get that thing on the ground. Moments. Let's let whatever there, happened yeah. happen. Okay. Let's get the game tied. Here we go. Yeah. Everybody can take a breath and we can start over. Um, and then the next pitch, he hung a slider. Yeah. He left it up there. He left it up a little backup slider. Um, and I was able to get it in the gap. So both, both runs scored, which actually put us up one. Um, and then I was standing on second base. So like it was, 
it was it was it was it was cool because it, it was a lot of that World Series was, is kind of a blur. Be, you know, I don't remember a lot of specifics. Um, but that at bat, you must that at bat, I remember. Um, Do you just replay that in your head all the time? <laughs> no, no? I, don't, I don't think. About oh it. man, I don't think about it. It was 22 years ago. Yeah, you know, like, it was a long time ago. Yeah. Um, but you know, it, it like it, it was obviously a highlight of my career. Um, but really, it was more important that we got we got up one. Now our bullpen can hold it, and they did. Right. We had to get to a game seven. Right. And if we get to a game seven now, obviously anything can happen. Um, Gary hits a bases loaded double. Um, I don't remember who scored the first run or how the first run scored. Um, you guys just took care of business. And it was like four to one or something yeah, like that. Yeah, four to one. Was yeah, something round. like that. Yeah. Um, but like we knew as, a, as an offense, our jo- we were trying to get their starter out. If we could get their starter out, we, we figured our bullpen could beat their, anybody else's bullpen. Mm. And that was kind of our, that was kind of our plan. Um, and that worked out most of the time, not all the time, right? Yeah. <laughs> not all the time. I mean, we are human. People, people mess up. Yeah. Um, have bad days. Um, but it was, it, it's, it, that's, was really from our offensive perspective, what our, our, our plan was, was mm. we just, if we get their starter out in five, mm-hmm. we're going to win this game. And it didn't work out that day because I think we got to the seventh. But <laughs> yeah, you won either um, way. But yeah. we won anyway. Yeah. Um, and that was like that. That was what's so important for us to. What I thought was so important to get to a tie game, because once we can get to a tie game, now it's a bullpen battle. Yeah. And I like our bullpen over theirs, over theirs. That's good. And that's really that was really the plan. That's good. Did you get named World Series MVP? Was that something that you were expecting? Were you even I, thinking about it? Never even thought about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, you know, everything's over. People are running around the field. Yeah. Honestly, I wanted. I just wanted to go in the clubhouse and hang out and yeah. party with party. the boys, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And people grabbed me and threw me on a stage, and I was like, oh, "God, my guys are in there. I don't really want to be up here, <laughs> right? My guys are in there." <laughs> oh, that's uh, awesome. And it was great. I mean, listen, it, it's always nice to get awards and recognized, yeah. right? But that's not why we're in it, right? Right? We were in it to win games. We were in it to win the ring. That's why we were there, right? Yeah, I got a really nice silver trophy that sits in my house, and I'm very proud of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's not why we do it. That's not why why I was why I wanted to go get to a World Series. Mm-hmm. I wanted to get to a World Series to win a World Series ring, and we did. We did. Yeah. And it's, it sits next to the trophy, but um, and it's way smaller. But <laughs> you know, the trophy's like that. But it means more to me than than that trophy ever will. If you got a World Series ring today, it might be the same size. Well, things are just oh, getting bigger now. and bigger. Oh, even <laughs> even that one, twenty two years ago, it's so gaudy. I've never even put it on. Before you know, they're going to be knuckles because it's just like taking up the whole hand. I put it on a couple times, like in my house. It has never left my house with on my hand. <laughs> I can assure you. Oh my gosh! So that's. I mean, we have completely stopped doing the puzzle. Yeah, that, that's fun to talk about. I, I, like I, I wanted... wasn't kidding. Multitasking is not my yeah. not my best move. <laughs> <laughs> I th- I've heard I've heard theories that it's not even physically possible to multitask. Your brain just is either really good at switching ideas or it's not good at it. Not yeah. there's no way to. I'm not good at switching things. ideas. <laughs> like I I, I if, if I'm posed a handful of problems, yeah. I fix one, then I'm I fix the next one, yeah. then I fix the next one, then I get the next one. It's probably the best way. You to know, do it. I eat the same way. Yeah. Like I eat, eat the vegetables, then I eat the rice, then I eat the meat. Right? It's just. <laughs> Food like, doesn't touch. Yeah, no, it's just, I don't mind if they touch, but it's yeah. just like I, I just that, that doesn't make sense. Uh, it doesn't work for me. That's good. Like if we want to sit down and do a puzzle, turn everything off. We'll do a puzzle. Okay. Right. But if you want me to talk, I can't do the puzzle. Don't don't turn it off. <laughs> no. but, but if you want me to chat, I can't do the puzzle at the same time. <laughs> Noted. Uh, the the World Series obviously was huge, but before that, rewinding the clock, 1996 Olympics, that had to be just. Pretty awesome for you to be able to For play, sure. Those were the two highlights of my career, mm. of my baseball career. You know, at, at that point, that group was still only college kids, mm-hmm. right? They hadn't, they hadn't let the minor leagues, minor league guys play in it yet. Um, so in terms of an amateur baseball career, mm-hmm. that was the pinnacle. Cool. Um, and it's something I, you know, we, actually I lucked out because, you know, the, it's a four-year thing. Most, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of the players only stay three. So you, you kind of have to fit in the right spot. Um, I was a sophomore, not a junior. Okay. So most of the kids, most of the guys were juniors. We had a few sophomores, but most of the guys were juniors, and you know, had gotten drafted in June, and this thing was in August, and then they went off and had their careers, and I went back to school. Um, and I don't know if the Olympics was something on my mind that this is something I want to do because I, it was just so far off and kind mm-hmm. of unattainable. Mm-hmm. Really, I thought. Um, 
but then as I got into college, started doing better, uh, started doing well, and, and then started getting some, started getting invited to those things. Yeah. And um, I thought, huh, maybe maybe this is something, you know, I can do. Um, and it was just, it was so cool. Fortunately for us, it was in, in Atlanta. Nice. Right. So we were playing at Old Fulton County Stadium. Yep. You know, because it was a, we were here in the United States, there was, there was we had sixty two thousand. Whether we were playing Australia or Cuba, it's crazy. The place was shaking, right? And what was the biggest crowd before that that you'd ever played in front of? A few hundred, maybe. Yeah. You know. Wow. You know, parents and a couple of girlfriends. <laughs> like that was, Hopefully not at the same time. Not at the same time. <laughs> you know? And they weren't my girlfriends. I'm just saying they were. You know? <laughs> I did not have multiple girlfriends. Uh, <laughs> But it was just, you know, like, I went to UCLA, right? UCLA's yeah. in LA, right? In, in, obviously in Los Angeles, and we got the Dodgers down there, and yeah. so, like, college b- baseball wasn't, isn't a big deal there. Yeah. Like, I can remember we had a, a, the next year, we were number one in the country, US, USC was number two, and we played a weekend series, and there was, like, 1,200 people, hmm. you know, <laughs> one against two. Now, if that was LSU and Alabama, yeah. there would have been twelve or 13,000. Sure. Right? So, playing in front of that was, 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 New, yeah, obviously, but I think I kind of learned. I learned a lot there. That helped me out. Whatever that would have been six years later, right? Playing in the World Series, right? It was that the crowd really just becomes white noise, and it almost becomes quiet in your head when you're thrown into the fire like that in an extreme level. It's like everything after that is yeah. less easy. Yeah, I mean, I was 19 years old. I didn't mm-hmm. have any. I was not prepared <laughs> to play, in, but I did fine. Right, mm-hmm. and and it proved to me that that was not a big, that was not a big deal for me, mm-hmm. um, and really the whole group played really well, so it wasn't really a big deal for any of us. Um, but it was, it, you know, just to to kind of achieve at that point what what the not knowing what the future would hold, mm-hmm. the highest level of amateur baseball that the United States has to offer, wow. and at that time, and well, I guess still, but it was you know, but, but it was super cool because a lot of us had played both summers together. Um, we were all in college, so we played against each other. Um, you know, we had Stanford guys and USC guys and Cal State Fullerton guys and LSU mm. guys and Clemson guys. You know, we were from all over the place, mm. and we played against each other um, before. Cool. Now you're and then together. now we're teammates. Yeah. Um, you know, but it, it, there's something different with wearing the USA across your chest. Oh, yeah. Right? Than, than any other uniform you're ever going to wear. Um, because we were all college kids, right? It wasn't a business, right? Nobody was making money. Nobody mm. was doing anything. We were there because we loved to be there and wanted to be there. It's pure. As, as it could get. Yeah. Right? I'm sure somebody was making money, but it wasn't <laughs> us, right? <laughs> um, you know, you still had to be an amateur, all those kinds of things, right? right. So, you know, it, it was just an experience that was, was just pure baseball and pure, the enjoyment and the fun that we had was just, it was, it was just pure. It was, for lack of a better term. I think that's really good perspective, especially with the World Baseball Classic these days. A lot of fans still are not on board with it, and they keep talking about, like, oh, it's, it's an exhibition game, but then you hear from the players, and like, this is the most fun we've ever had playing baseball because they're representing their country. Correct. So can you talk about, you, you said that there's nothing like it when you have USA mm-hmm. written on your chest. What did that mean for you personally? Again, like, it was, you, you don't really... Really, ever you know, you don't have many opportunities mm-hmm. to do it all. We had one, mm-hmm. um, but it wasn't. I think it was different for us. We had a different perspective as baseball players because that was not the pinnacle of our entire career, but is that our amateur career, yeah. right? You know, we weren't we weren't track and field guys. We weren't, I don't know, badminton players or whatever, right? So where that was the absolute peak that their sporting life would ever get to. Mm-hmm. You know, we weren't training four years to play in the Olympics, right? Right. It was just the start. It was just it was just the end of our summer yeah. league that we played in, um, and not to diminish it by any means. It was just we were there representing the United States as the best group of twenty five that we could put together against the internationals. Mm. Um, the other countries take it very very serious, and mm. we were too at that point. Mm. Um, you know, with with the WBC, you know, I'd say. The players definitely, I'm don't get me wrong, the players take it serious and they want to win because listen, we're all competitors and we want to win. We're in like the first two weeks of spring training. Yeah. You know, we're not game, we're not, those guys aren't, you know, mid season form. No. Not and either. I don't know what the other countries do 
to get ready for it. You know, I just, I, I don't have that information, but you know, yeah, our guys, our guys are, they're more prepared than if it wouldn't have been a WBC mm-hmm. year, but you can't, you can't get mid season form two weeks into camp. No, you no just way. can't. There's no way. You know, you might, yeah, you might take a couple more live ABs before you leave, but do you, do you wish that they would play that at a different time? I mean, it's not convenient. There is no time. perfect time. Yeah, there isn't. Right, because there's no way you're going to get a group of guys to go after the season's yeah. over. That's not going to happen. Yeah. Right, because everybody's gas. No way, yeah. You're, you can't do it in the middle of the winter because nobody's ready. And there's no way they're going to stop the season. No, there's no way. You know? And no way that any manager would be okay with sending any of his players to that during those seasons. For sure. Season. Yeah. Right, like the perfect time would be okay, let's stop, let's stop, the, stop the whole league for two weeks. At the All Star break, yeah, but right still, now everybody's yeah. ready to go. That's nerve wracking. But that will managers. never yeah, happen. No, there's no way. You know, <laughs> you yeah. know I was asked a question uh, about that. So I was just in Taiwan about about a month ago because my son played on the uh, the 12U national team. Oh, cool. And he got to wear the USA across his chest. Very nice. Which was cool. And they asked me there, you know, would would uh, because baseball's now back in the Olympics. It, it, I guess probably depending on kind of what city they're in, mm-hmm. right? Because who wants to, you know, who wants to build a baseball field in some country that doesn't play baseball, right? Yeah. Spend all the money to build a field, and then once the Olympics are gone, nobody uses it. Yeah. Right. So, you know, it works here, works in London, places like that. But, you know, would the Ameri- would the United States ever send their actual major leaguers? And I said, absolutely not. No. No. Absolutely not. One, we would beat everybody if we sent twenty five of our absolute best major leaguers. Yeah, we went. We beat everybody, but there's no way the league's going to stop for two weeks. Hmm. And then they brought up the guy brought up to me about the NHL because the NHL shuts down. Right. I'm like that's different. Yeah. I don't know why it's different, but it's <laughs> different. different. <laughs> <laughs> I can't give you a good reason why it's different, but it's different. <laughs> NHL decided to do that. MLB will not do that. Won't do it. I promise. Yeah. There's yeah. no way. So this is kind of out of left field, but I've always wondered. Wondered. Um, I remember during your career, uh, you had had a couple forty home run seasons mm-hmm. and a thirty home run season, and then it was like, hey, what what happened to Troy Gloss this year? And a few little like talks about injuries, but also I heard some things about eyesight and contact. And I remember seeing you at the plate and like you yeah. doing that a lot. And and in Googling this, I found out some stuff, but I want you to share really quickly, like what went on there and how did you resolve it? So I wore, con- I mean, I've been, I wore glasses from the time I was, I don't know, 10 or 11 mm-hmm. um, and pretty, pretty substantial ones. Um, so was that, you know, not playing without them or playing without them was not an option. Mm. Um, so I'd, I'd worn contacts, uh, got in touch. So the irregular, you know, go to, you know, whatever, go to the pharmacy, they order them and, mm-hmm. you know, you put them in. I was really struggling with them because I had a little bit of astigmatism as well, so they kind of had to sit right. Um, I really struggled in some of the downtown areas where maybe the air wasn't as cl- as clean, mm. um, or certainly in places where it was super dry. Sure. Um, Anaheim was actually okay. Had a little. You could still get in the evening games. You'd still get some of the uh, onshore flow, yeah. right? So the humidity was a little bit higher at maybe night bit than easier. it is yeah. during the yeah. day. Um, you know, Oakland, kind of the same way. San Francisco. I mean, uh, Seattle, San Francisco, but. Colorado, Texas, um, some of the places that were drier, Detroit, because the air was not super oh, clean. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Motor City. Um, <laughs> and I started getting some infections in my eyes. And then, so then I, I talked to uh, Mark McGuire, because I know he had some issues with it. Mm. He gave me his doctor, who was up in, uh, in the Bay Area somewhere. I forget what, exactly what city he was in. And we were in playing Oakland or San Francisco, and I went over and saw him. And he gave me some weighted kind of contacts. They stayed more. Mm more fit okay um which solved some of the problems not all of them okay um you know every time you blink for anybody who wear contact yeah. you know I'm wearing some right there's now. there's yeah. no guarantee when you open back your eyes that it's going to be pointing the right direction yeah <laughs> it just isn't it's not fun. so the weighted ones were better but it didn't solve all the problems i still having the same problems in the in the dirty air in the dry air windy yeah things like that um so I went in 2001, maybe. I went to a doctor, uh, Tom Tuma, down in Newport Beach, um, the Laser Eye Center, because that's where Tiger went. I had a, nice. one, another one of my teammates uh, had gone, a uh, pitcher, not a hitter, but had, he had gone 
So I went in and talked to him. And I said, okay, this is my problem. This is what I'm going through. And I, I met with a guy in New York, Chicago. So like I was mm-hmm. doing my research. Yeah. And the guy in New York and Chicago are like, oh, yeah, we'll do it. I get down to the guy in Newport Beach. He's like, won't do it. It's like, oh, that's why, not what why I wanted not? to hear. He goes, the technology is not good enough yet. Oh, really? So I and said, well, I can appreciate that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. The other two guys didn't tell me that, right? Wow. <laughs> so he goes, technology is not good enough. I'll call you when it is. Wow. Okay. So this fast forward a couple years. So probably 2003. Uh, yeah, probably 2003. Because I, I, I had my surgery literally like two days before I got married. Oh, so, nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it was like December of 03. Um, There's a scene clearly joke in there somewhere. Yeah, by the no, way. no. We were good. We were good. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Still married to the same person. <laughs> good. So, um, uh, Troy Percival goes down there and he gets it done. Wow. And Tom told him, hey, go call Troy. I'll do it now. Nice. So I immediately drove down there, got it done. Um, went to sleep, woke up. However long I was asleep, I don't know how, but probably this is now because they, they, you know, they, they cover your eyes mm-hmm. with like patches you can't see, right? Got so it. you can't drive home. Um, went to bed or went to sleep, woke up, and I could see my alarm clock literally from here to the, the fridge. Like a regular sized one, not a, not a big yeah. one. Yeah. Right. And I couldn't see this if it was right on my nightstand. Oh my gosh. So it boom, worked. immediately. Wow. Worked. Um, there was obviously a lot of trepidation because um, nothing's guaranteed. Yeah. Right. There's not, there, no surgery of any kind is 100%. Um, but I was fed up. I was, I was losing 50 to 80 at bats a year just by these contacts. Hey, you went through right. something like 20 contacts? Oh, all kinds. Year, I yeah. tried them all. It's crazy. And I just, just fighting it. Right. And I just got fed up with it. And I didn't, you know, I was losing, like literally I was losing 50 to 80 at bats a year. Cause I'd blink, look up and, and it, it would have moved. Right. But now the ball's coming. Yeah. So now a, I'm not going to hit it, but B, if it's going to hit me, I'm not going to see yeah, it. And say, that sounds terrifying. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So I just became, I was like, I'm done. And that's when I went to Tom the first time, Dr. Tuma. And then, uh, when he said no, I stuck it out for a couple years. Mm. Um, so like during the world series, I was still wearing contacts. And then obviously in 03, he finally called me and said, yeah, I'll do it. And it was life changing. That's so cool. I've had it. I've had one eye. I don't remember which one, but I've had one eye kind of touched up once, mm-hmm. um, in like 08 or seven, but I still see 2015. Wow. Even so, today. So you've had eye surgery. That's completely changed your eyes for life. Yeah. Brain study. That's changed your brain for life. Before you know it, there's going to be some surgery where like, you're going to be like, Hey, I'm going back to the major leagues. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's there's no there's no surgery, no reverse to, to, to off put father time. Yeah. Right? Not yet. Father time is undefeated. Not yet. He gets everybody uh, at some point. Troy, this this has been fun, man. We have done a really crappy job of making this puzzle, but we we well, had some listen, good conversation. I told you, like, if you want to do a puzzle? Turn everything off. We'll do a puzzle. <laughs> So let's let's get into our 27th out. It's our lightning round. I'm going to ask you some okay. r- rapid-fire questions. You ready to rock? Yeah. All right, let's do this. One ritual of yours that your teammates only knew about before games? I always... I, I if, if available, I always ate a tuna sandwich before the game. Mm, tuna. Why tuna? I like tuna. <laughs> there you go. Good reason. <laughs> Who's the one guy you hated facing? So I didn't like... I didn't, I didn't hate facing anybody. Um... But Jeff Nelson gave me fits. Really? Yes. Just because of how tall he was? It or? just I didn't pick him up very well. Wow. There was a couple, him and Jeff Weaver, okay. who, who played here at Fresno State, oh, he, yeah. he gave me fits. Um, I just couldn't pick him up. He had that funky wind up. Yeah, too, yeah. So. He was actually my roommate on the uh, Olympic team. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Uh, who's your favorite player of all time? Can't say yourself. <laughs> I wouldn't. It's not even my kids. Uh, Cal Ripken. Oh, that's awesome. How about right now? There's a lot of good ones right yeah, now. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of really good players right now. Um, you know what? I, I love the way Bryce Harper plays. Mm, nice. um, he plays hard. I and met and him. I, I respect that a lot, right? And he's yeah. play, he plays through injuries, and he plays every day, which, which is something that I took pride in trying to do. Now, it cost me some games along the way, yeah. trying to play through stuff I probably shouldn't have, but I, that I respect. He played at the Juco World Series, which was my first month of being in a new job in Grand Junction, mm-hmm. Colorado. He was still 17 years old. It was the week before the draft. 
And he hit a home run that got out of that stadium in two seconds. And I swear, half the stadium didn't even see it because it did. It probably did not get above 10 feet above the ground. Yeah, no, he's, he's a special he's talent. A but we're so lucky right now. There's so many good players yeah. in the major leagues right now. It's, it, it's mind-boggling. Some of the things it's these fun. guys can do now at the sizes and stuff that they are, that's what people don't realize when they watch a game. Yeah. Is, yeah, these guys are all really good. They have no idea how big these people are, too. Yeah, you really like, don't realize these, these, these guys are enormous. Yeah. Right, they don't. They don't look enormous because they're all enormous, right? Like, yeah, they're all huge. So when you put them all together, nobody stands out. Yep, <laughs> it's know? so true. It's so true. Uh, is there any player that you emulated growing up or while you were? Cal, in no, yeah. no question. Right, cool. like I was. I played shortstop up through college um, at UCLA. I played short, and he was the the first kind of of the the tall offensive mm -hmm. shortstops. Mm -hmm. You know, he was. I mean, there's, there's no even one B. He cool. was he was the guy I tried I tried to be like. That's awesome. Uh, favorite coach that you ever played with? Gary Adams, okay. my uh, college coach. And that was at UCLA. At UCLA, yeah. Very nice. He taught me how to work. Cool. Right. He 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 taught me that hard work does pay off. Mm. Right. He, he was. Yeah, he's a bit of a drill sergeant. Yeah. Um, you know, but I love him to death. I still talk to him today. Um, you know, obviously, you know, we're all getting older. But, you know, he's, he's a wonderful man. He came into my life at a, at a very, at a perfect time. Mm. Um, cool. And I appreciate him for it. That's very cool. Favorite non-home stadium to play at? Boston. Oh, okay. Any specific reason why? Because the fans are right on top of you. Mm. And that's cool. when you get booed on the road, that's awesome. <laughs> you know you're good when you're getting booed. Uh, now, getting booed at home, which I've also had happen, yeah, <laughs> less than awesome. <laughs> but getting booed on the road is awesome. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. Uh, is there a person while you're growing up or a thing that really made you love the game of baseball? You know, I think I think loving any sport really comes from within. Hmm. Um, but my mom, for sure. Really? My mom, um, you know, she had thrown me BP and stuff against the garage when I was no a little kidding. kid. And, and then my, well, it started with my grandma, and she threw me tennis balls, and I smoked her. <laughs> and then, so she stopped. And then my mom did it, and then I smoked her. So she stopped, and she and she's like, you got to go play with the neighborhood kids. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, so but nobody cool. in my family was a baseball player, right? Wow. So it was just, uh, you know, it was something, like, I played all the sports growing up. Played football, played basketball. Yeah. You know, growing up in San Diego, you know, we'd... we'd we surfed and rode our bikes and did all that kind of stuff. And, and, but the one thing I always got signed up for was baseball. Mm. Um, That's cool. So she was in, instrumental in, in my development as a baseball player. That's so cool. Um, if a movie was made about you today, who would you like to play your character? Oh. Well, I'd say The Rock, just from obviously body. Yeah, similarities. obviously. <laughs> I mean, really, just have to transpose the face and be all good. I was going to say, there's right? the eyebrow right there. Yeah. Can you smell what the rock is cooking? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's the best answer. And my kid will love that. So. Yeah, good. Go. <laughs> if, any, if I were to ask any of your teammates one word that describes Troy, what would it be? Reliable. Hmm. That's good. You got a 12-year-old son now. Yes. So no matter if it's you telling your 12 year old son or you going back to your 12 year old self, what's the one thing that you would say to 12 year old Troy? Make sure you understand and, and have a great grasp of your fundamentals mm. and don't be afraid to have fun. Don't, don't ever lose having fun. Cool. I love it. All right. Our final pitch question with you getting ready to coach your son you know, he's couple in seventh years. grade. It'll couple be a couple years. years, but as you get ready for that, is there nerves? Is there excitement? What what comes with that? Yeah, yeah, all of it, all of it right? <laughs> uh, no, it, it'll be great. It'll be great. Um, you know, it, it's it's not something I certainly set out to do, um, but I know I can help him. I know I can help help him achieve his goals in this mm -hmm. game. Um, for a couple reasons. A, you know, it was obviously the fundamentals. I know them. I know this game. I've been in this game for 35, 40 years, yeah. right? Um, there's not much in this game I don't understand. There are some. You know, pitching's not really my thing. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> but that's our way of pitching coaches, yeah. right? Never caught, so I don't really know how to do that. Um, but I, 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 
I want to be on his journey with him. That's cool. You know, and I, obviously I want, I want all of his dreams and goals yeah. to come true. And if I can help him with that, I absolutely will. That's awesome. Very nice. Troy, this has been a ton of fun. This might be my, the most fun I've had with an interview so far. <laughs> Thank so you. Thanks so much, man. I appreciate you got your time. It. Thank you very much. Okay, next week we have Rachel Balkovic. Rachel, a female? Yes, a female on the show. Rachel is the first ever minor league baseball manager. And whether you're on board with that or not, that's not the point. She has an amazing story of adversity, of overcoming adversity, of triumph, of just desire coming to the forefront of everything. This this woman, like, I just want you to put aside all of the, like, maybe preconceived notions that you have about whether this is a man sport or a woman sport and just listen to the story. It's an amazing story. We're really excited to have Rachel on the show. So make sure you check that out next week. Please subscribe. If you liked this video, if you liked this podcast, share it with three of your friends. I know if you're a baseball fan, you've got other friends, share it with them. Please subscribe and share with three other baseball friends of yours. And if you know any current or former MLB players or coaches or figures, I'd love to have them on the show. Just shoot me a DM on Instagram at setupmanpod, or you can email me if that's more of your thing, kyle at setupman.net. All right, Setup Man Nation, I will see you next week. For now, I'm putting the arm on ice. (laughs) 